I didn't realize where the camera was yesterday, so I was watching it, and I was laughing at Ryan for smoking, yeah. but you're talking, but the camera's on both of us, so you just see me being like, <laughs> Hey guys, we're live. Oh, cool. hey. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Squanch Wise Cracks Rick and Morty podcast. My name is Jared, and joining me are the Squanchers. We got Ryan. Hey, what a what what was that up, everybody? And Al. <laughs> hey. And today we're breaking down the last episode, the final episode of Rick and Morty that we have not covered yet. Season two, episode eleven, the wedding Squanchers. Oh shit! So, yeah. Coming to an end. I mean, this is a sad day, kind of, right? It's a sad day. We are going to do a mailbag episode. We're going to do one more episode just to clear out the inbox of all these people who have spent their time sending us emails, and we're going to uh, address them all. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's bittersweet. Just means Dan and Justin should hurry up with season four. Yeah, what the fuck? We need those other 70 episodes, stat. Yeah. You know, this is a good time to mention Mike McMahon is writing a new animated series of Star Trek, but why isn't he writing Rick and Morty? An animated comedy version, right? Oh, it's comedy? It's I just an knew an, it was animated. It's an animated comedy Star Trek uh, TV show. Sounds awesome. I'm very wow. excited. Even if it's comedy? Fucking Star Trek, man. Any, it's, anything. It's, but, but I need that hit. I need that hit, man. I mean, ever, right. ever since the Star Wars Star Trek debate, I, have, I can't wait for a new Star uh, Trek IP to come out, you know? Yeah, but you haven't seen any of it. <laughs> well, right. Well, I guess I should I also back. have not seen any of it. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to Rick and Morty. So let's get first impressions from the wedding squanchers. What was it like the first time you watched it? What was it like revisiting it, Ryan? Man, I really, uh, I kind of forget about this episode a lot, and and I'm really glad we revisited it, because I love this episode. I, yeah. I forget about it. Um, it's It kind of, I think one of the reasons it's a, it's, less memorable is because it does have a very big cliffhanger. It doesn't feel like a full episode, yeah. you know? And then we had to wait literally a year and a fucking half, thanks, Mr. Poopy Butthole, to fuck yeah. see the next uh, part of it. So I think that that's why this one kind of gets lost to the fold. But, man, it's so funny. The character development is awesome for everybody, and uh, it really moves the whole Smith family along. And, yeah, like, and, and then it's got that, that gut punch of an ending where, you know, Rick sacrifices himself seemingly for the first time and does the first non-selfish thing in his life. Yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. Anyway, I love it. A plus. All right. What about you, Alec? I'm going to maybe like a B, B plus. It's, I like the episode for a lot of the same reasons. Character development, I think narratively it's important and I appreciate it for all that stuff. It's not like the most funny episode to me though. I laughed. I mean, I laughed a couple of times. Also, the Bird end... person, dude. You didn't laugh at any bird person? You didn't? Uh, this is the this is by the way I we, mean, we should say off the bat that this is the episode that our fucking podcast gets basically its name from right I mean Squan Squanchy no, 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 was Squanchy's, are, Squanch, Squanchy's in that party but this episode. is his biggest this is his most featured role I mean we're, it's on Planet no, Squanch his, yeah it's his on most, fucking his Squanch most featured planet. role is where he's squanching in the garage with a noose around his hey, neck hey this is a family show okay don't say <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> um. I mean, it also gives us that great Mr. Poopy Butthole ending, which is phenomenal. I'm yeah. not I'm not hating on the episode. Bird person's good. There's some really great jokes. But you know, there's just some episodes that are that are funnier. Sure. It's it's That's why odd. those get A plus pluses. Yeah. <laughs> it's an odd episode, simply because there I mean, there are very few episodes that don't have a definitive B plot, and this one only sort of does, but not really. And this one really does follow a narrative trajectory that um is I guess like less happens in this episode than in a normal episode where things are just moving at such breakneck speed. I'm always, it's always, I learn so much whenever I do the recaps. This is one of the shortest recaps I've done for any episode. Uh, and it's, you learn a lot when you try and realize like how can I tell the story being as efficient as possible while still maintaining enough information to be able to have it make sense. And yeah, so not a lot happens in this episode. I agree with Ryan that I think that it's a great ending for Rick. Not a real ending. I'm actually curious. Do you guys know, I guess with the Mr. Poopy Butthole thing at the ending, they're already greenlit for season three by the time this finale happened, right? I also think yeah. the new season came out. He's like, come back in like a year and a half. And didn't the new season come out a year and a half almost on the day? Yeah. Uh, so that was a nice little troll. <laughs> but do you guys think... That I mean, I guess if it was if they were already greenlit for season three, why did it take so long? Because it takes a long time to animate, make a sure. fucking and, animated cartoon. Dude. And Dan Harmon is a crazy perfectionist too. Sure, 
Yeah. Because I was thinking that this works as almost a great pseudo ending. Like when I watched this episode and I had forgotten about the Mr. Poopy Butthole thing at the end and then after the credits I saw it. But I feel like this would have been – if they did say that, all right, we don't know if we're going to get renewed for season three, so let's come up with an ending – for Rick that mm. could function on its own. I think that they did a really good job. Maybe maybe they wrote it and were animating it, and then in the middle they got greenlit, then they did the Mr. Poopy Bubble Yeah, ending. it almost feels like, uh, I won't be too specific with spoilers, but the end of season four, Breaking Bad, which I still think is the best ending of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, I don't... I've the seen close, Breaking Bad. The close-up on the, the plant right. in, the, in the pool yard. So they didn't know if they were going to get greenlit for another season. And so they wrote it so that this could function as an ending for the show. I still think it's the best ending. Not that season five isn't great. I mean, it's one of the best mo- best moments of the show were in season five. But I think that this functions similarly. Yeah. If we had just left the show knowing that Rick has some sort of redemption, that he actually does get vulnerable and does, as he says in the episode, open himself up and sacrifice himself for his family, it would be a yeah. fulfilling end to the character and to the series if mm-hmm. it had to end. But anyway, let's go into a recap. A regular Smith family breakfast is interrupted by a membrane-shaped alien courier that invites them to Bird Person and Tammy's wedding on Planet Squanch. Rick doesn't want to go, but when he accidentally ships Jerry to the wedding, the whole family reluctantly follows him. Initially cold and distant, Rick eventually warms up to the idea of the wedding and gives Bird Person a heartfelt toast. Just then, Tammy whips out a gun and reveals she's a narc for the Federation sent to capture Rick bird person and their cohorts she kills bird person and the federation swoops in causing the smiths to make a narrow escape rick informs the family that they won't be able to return to earth so they find a new planet to inhabit rick overhears the smiths considering to turn him into the government so they can return home after reflecting on how much he's hurt the family rick decides to turn himself in while the smiths return to their now federation controlled earth end of episode All right, guys, before we move on, I want to give a shout-out to our sponsor over at Greats. So Greats is Brooklyn's first sneaker company. I am actually, if you guys are watching on the live stream, I'm actually wearing Greats shoes right now. And they've been great. They've been very comfortable. I've gone on vacation to them. I wear them, like, every day to work. I've walked on beaches to them. They're very versatile. And I haven't had any problems. Uh, They offer men and women styles. They sell classic styles, made the best, for less. Best sellers include... All leather Royale lace up and Wooster slip ons. You can save 15% off your first purchase with our code SQUANCH. The ones I've got are called the Bab V2s. So, if I don't even know if you guys can see, I can't lift my leg. I'm not much of a gymnast here. So, I mean, come on, guys. I write most of the day. I can't move. Um, You're a stiff old man. That's, I'm a stiff old man, exactly. So, if you guys are looking for a recommendation, I recommend the Bab V2. Ryan, you got some Rosens. How those been treating you? Oh, man. When I go out, I feel like I look good for the first <laughs> time in my life. So. All right. He's not getting mistaken for being homeless anymore. So, guys, check out Greats. It's working out. Go to greats.com. Save 15% off your first purchase with the code SQUANCH. And back to the show. So, guys, I think the most unique thing about this episode is Rick's flirtation with caring and how they really do set up a, a great arc for him. And it's... One thing I didn't really remember is I remembered him turning himself in at the end. I remembered him giving Bird Person that toast where that seems totally out of character in which he says, Bird Person is my best friend, and if he loves Tammy, well, then I love Tammy too. To friendship, to love, and to my greatest adventure yet, opening myself up to others. Now, of course, this is hilarious because directly after this, Tammy reveals that she's an arc and has (laughs) been dating Bird Person for a long time and deciding to marry him. A and teenage narc, by the way. A teenage, a teenage narc. undercover agent. Right. But the thing that I didn't remember is that initially Rick doesn't want to go to the wedding. He cast doubt on the label of best friend to describe bird person. He calls weddings just funerals with cake. He's totally unenthused and grumpy at the wedding. But eventually, he comes around. And but, he's, I, but he's still like, listen, I don't believe in marriage, but I guess a bird person's happy. He still is a bit grumpy before that. Like, I think he leads up to it saying something like, look, I'm smart. I'm not kind. Kindness is just a thing that dumb people do to hedge their bets. But I'm going to be kind anyway. Did Which, you... even with that level of self-awareness, the fact that he's then going to say something kind, I think, makes it extra special. Did you notice what was written on his speech paper? <laughs> yeah, it was whatever he said and then Tra- hesitate 
trails off. Yeah, trails off. Crumbles up paper. Yeah. Improv. I yeah. was at a wedding where someone did that. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? Did they actually announce oh, be, it? Be, no, well, so this was my old roommate who was like, hey, Al, check out my speech I'm going to give. And it was a piece of paper that said trails off, crumbles up paper. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> <laughs> was it a reference to Rick and Morty? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't, I mean... It doesn't seem like the most original joke, but oh, yeah. who Shut would have up. known that besides him, though? <laughs> I well, it was a it was a Rick and Morty crowd there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the only and the only real B plot that functions here, or what you might call a B plot, is Jer- b- jokes about Jerry being jobless and him <laughs> being tactless, and Beth wanting to connect with Rick, or her being passive aggressive about how Rick spent her childhood as a revolutionary with bird person instead of being with the family some of the jerry jokes in this one are some of my favorite i love that as rick is doing this beautiful thing of turning himself in for the family he's like my name is jerry smith and i love licking big sweaty balls oh dude yeah. that part and then yeah and then the <laughs> operator is like okay that is like my favorite line in the movie it's just that guy's performance is going okay <laughs> my favorite joke it's kind of a very wisecracky joke, but it's when when Tammy reveals herself to be the narc, she says verbatim something like, uh, you know, oh, my God, I'm like a teenager who's about to marry a bird person. It's like, oh, my God. And then another very part, funny part is, is Summer goes, yeah, go, Tammy. <laughs> and then uh, – and then she says, but I'm not. I'm actually an undercover agent for the Federation and, you know, everyone – this place is surrounded. And then Beth says – I don't get the metaphor. And then Jerry's like, I'll explain it to you yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I would love to have seen what Jerry would have said. <laughs> but I just love it how he has to be the guy who always gets it, even if he's completely full of shit. Because he's so emasculated at every corner, he has to at least gesture towards the fact that he's understanding something elevated. What One joke that I love for completely inane reasons is, what is it? Uh the trick is to keep 70% of the cereal above the milk, which is absolutely true. <laughs> How do you do that, though? Well, so you make a big mound, and then you pour a little bit of milk so that— You, you just know, put less milk in. Well, no, yeah, but also that's how you stack it. Yeah, it's it's the milk. You don't pour the milk, milk all over the fucking thing. You yeah, because then everything gets soggy. You make soggy. a moat around it. If there's like a hill on top, you can sort of push that over into the milk and get like you know some milk on it. Then eat it, nice, fresh, and crispy. Also, get a job, Jerry. <laughs> that's not a. I think that kind of knowledge. There's not a lot of people hiring for that kind of knowledge. Listen. You're just a serial. It's a life hack, dude. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. I my 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 favorite joke besides the uh, the one about Jerry eating or licking hairy testicles is is when the 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 whole squanch smurf. It's not it's not so much literal. It's contextual. It's contextual. You just oh. it's just what how you feel it, how you say it. And then Beth says, "I squanch my family." And they're uh, like, "Ooh, stop, stop saying that's it." Gross. <laughs> I also felt during watching this episode that. I don't think I've ever watched this episode and then immediately watched the first episode of season three. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there was a year and a half gap in between the release of them. But I think that there's something about the beginning of season three, episode one, that works really well with this in that if we take them as like one episode, this episode spends a lot of time focusing on how Jerry is emasculated, how he's completely worthless, how he needs to get a job and just about how everything in his life sucks. And then when season three, episode one starts, even kind of towards the end of this episode, we see first thing that happens, Jerry gets off the spaceship, a computer scans him, says, you're sad, here's antidepressants, he immediately feels better, and then he gets scanned again, and they say, oh, (laughs) uh, please go to the employment office to, and they don't even say to get a job, they say to get a function. Well, no, I I, I took that as, as when they gave him those antidepressants, he all of a sudden owed them money. Like that, yeah, yeah, he's like, the, you, right. you owe, you owe us money, so now you got to go get a job to get a function to pay us back for those antidepressants. And he's like, honey, I got a job. Yeah. <laughs> but I love it how they can just scan him and know that he's unemployed. It's yeah. just something so unemployable or just so unemployed about I, his I, existence. Well, I didn't even think that either. I, I, I took it as, as they knew his identity, right? And they knew he was unemployed. There's some database. Yeah, you're probably right. But it is funny to think about that his essence just exudes unemployment. Well, it's funny that they can scan him and know he's sad. Yeah. Well, it was, he was in deep distress, I think. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so anyway, when you go to season three, episode one, and you see him with his like third promotion and he's loving the all-pill diet, it 
you can kind of see how it is more of a reaction to things that are happening in this season finale rather than just a general joke about Jerry. Because I think that the whole unemployment thing and him being useless, that whole comedy really is at its, is at its densest in this episode. Yeah, and to your point, seeing them a year and a half, you don't connect the sort of pill joke later, you know, in that episode and then next season where this is now his job and he gets paid in pills. Oh, yeah. When season three, episode one started, I completely forgot that pills were even a part of the second season. Yeah, six chewable salary. Yeah. And I don't know about y'all, but but I didn't even get introduced to Rick and Morty till after season two had already come out and it was all on box sets and stuff. So it wasn't like I was watching these week to week or yeah. anything. It was just kind of like I have binged the whole fucking series, I feel like, in a weekend. Right. Because it was so awesome. Yeah, And then too. I forgot, yeah, by the time season three came and I was so jacked up for it, like, yeah, I kind of had forgotten some of the jokes in this episode. I think we had only been informed of its existence right after season two ended. Yeah, how how did this whole thing air and we didn't The whole thing happened, I think it was Jacob's nephew was a fan and... See, so I they, knew they about wa- it before. They, okay, well, I just know that they watched it together, and I think the first episode that Jacob saw that he told me to watch was the Memory Parasites episode. I I got in, I think, three or four episodes into season, and that same roommate who gave that speech, because we lived together at the time, I was watching, he's like, oh, I, you just found this show? Like, it's so fucking great. Uh, and then we, it was just a sort of communal activity we did. Huh. Yeah. I don't know who told me. How disappointed are you guys that we didn't see the ro- uh, whatever, like the robot bird person in season three. Well, well, Phoenix person. Phoenix person. When does he come? Doesn't he come up at the end of season three? No, it's season three, episode one. He's in the post credits. Oh right. I mean, I'm willing to wait if something good happens in season four. Yeah, I'm patient. I hope they don't forget about it entirely. Wait, your question is is are we sad that Phoenix person isn't like he never showed up in season three? Besides the one thing, yeah, I, I guess I'm sad about that. I love Phoenix <laughs> person. <laughs> Does but Tammy? They eat kept me Phoenix occupied now. What? Does Tammy eat Th- Phoenix stick now? It's a good question. <laughs> Maybe Let's figure that out. Is this the first time that we hear about? I don't think it is. Is it the first time? I know season three is all about Beth's relationship to Rick, but is this the first time that we explicitly hear how upset she is that he wasn't present for her childhood, or do we only hear it contextually in previous episodes? I think we hear it. We hear reference that he's left, that she doesn't want to scare him away again. I think it pops up, uh, but it's maybe not as front and center as it is here. I don't know. Do you disagree, Ryan? I, I, I remember at the very beginning them saying, you know, alluding to the, that Rick has just come back, like you were saying. But it definitely, there's that big moment when, when Rick's in the core of the earth, you know, and then she's having the fight with, with uh, Jerry and is like, like, look, I don't want him to leave, you fucking dumbass, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of, I think, when it really gets hit in the home, that, or hit home that, that she will do anything to, to keep her dad around and that, that, you know, was really traumatic for her. Yeah. And we never get any indication of what exactly Bird Person and Rick and presumably Squanchy were doing during that war. time. They were fighting but the government. Just in the, the name Federation. of freedom. The name because, of freedom. yeah, because Rick just says they thought that they had the right to rule the government I, or rule the galaxy. I disagree. They have committed horrible atrocities in the name of freedom, Jared. Yeah. Yeah. But we never hear anything more. You can just kind of, you know, make it up in your head. But, yeah, it sounds right. awful. Well, I mean, there, there's the lines like, uh, they're bureaucrats, Morty. What's he say? They're bureaucrats, Morty. They're not people. <laughs> right. Yeah. Bird person says, the road your father and I walk together is soaked deeply with the blood of both friends and enemies. And it's so funny how everything that he's describing is so horrific, but all Beth can hear is that, oh, they spent time together. Because immediately <laughs> after that, she says, must be nice. Uh, and then... Almost as if they're having like a suffering dick measuring contest. She's like, mm, "Well, I had to draw uh, a photo. I had to draw my family photos of him in with crayon." <laughs> <laughs> That's sad. Yeah, but so we also know that Bird Person, Rick, and Squanchy were in a band. Do you think the band led to the revolutionary activity, or do you think the revolutionary activity they were like retired from terrorism and then went and made a band? 
They're probably like all in the cadet academy together or something, and then uh, the all dropped academy. out together. And... So are you saying they were once part of the Federation and then became rebels? Well, while we're yeah, while we're all just bullshitting backstories yeah. here, you know, <laughs> yeah, <Why> probably. <laughs> yeah. The other thing we talked about in one of our videos is how how masterfully this this continues on into season three, episode one, in that we end on this hopeful note that Rick really is does care and that he's seeking redemption for his horrible acts and that he's sacrificing himself for his family. And then I just love how in season three, episode one, it's like, nope. It's all just an elaborate plan in his head to dismantle the government, mm -hmm. and you know there wasn't really much of a selfless act in there. Oh yeah, okay. See, that's the thing that I kind of forget going into uh, season three is that there's the whole like the forty chess he meant to get into fucking the the prison. So that really carries to the wedding, like when he gets arrested, you know, or when he chooses to get uh, arrested at the end. He's... Yeah, he, he ends up in the, the prison, which he knows he can escape from to steal some Galactic Federation shit to crash the currency and topple the government. Well, right, but so when he makes that decision to go to the jail in the core of the the, the Earth, of the small planet, he, really he's, he's concurrently saying, okay, I'm going to go there to bring down the Federation so I don't have to deal with this shit yeah, anymore. Yeah, and I, I think that's kind of clued in Interesting. in the beginning where he's in the mind interrogation thing. He's clearly aware uh, of like the model that they're using and how he can exploit it. So it seemed like he was going in. He knew that they were going to use this mind – what's it called? Uh, I don't mind know. interrogation thing right. uh, at Shoney's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that he would be able to use it to transplant his mind into a Gronfalmite's brain and then do all that shit. Right. <laughs> yeah. that's. Uh, I mean, that's interesting, though, that, that – I mean, he's so smart, right? He's so smart, 4D chess. <laughs> All the way. Yeah. And I'm surprised that that wasn't really – I don't know. I didn't really hear many people guessing that that would be the case. I feel like I saw it on Reddit somewhere. I mean everything's on Reddit, but – Sure. Uh, yeah, Rick is the smartest man on earth. How He's clearly got some plan to get out of this. Yeah. I love – one another joke that I really like is – that Tammy's ring is a pine cone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, Summer says, I love your ring. And Tammy says, thanks. It was Bird Person's grandmother's. She fought a squirrel for it. <laughs> that's probably my second favorite joke. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. I loved how Squanchy turns into like super Squanchy and he like becomes like this huge buff cat thing. Yeah. Bullets are deflecting off of him. Yeah. Squanch is, Squanch is one of the more interesting characters, I feel like, in all of Rick and Morty verse. <laughs> because personally. he seems to be as disturbed as Rick, right? Yeah, but he's also trying to get through it as much as Rick. And, and he's all he has that party bone in his body that, you know, he'll just go and get fucked up. Yeah. And, you know, Squanch all over town. And, yeah. what There was one very subtle thing. <clears throat> so when Rick is giving his speech about how Bird Person is his best friend. Yeah. Is it Squanchy walks by, or someone walks by and is like, throws something down like, fuck. Oh, Squanchy's sitting down and he has an armband that says Rick's BFF that he just like tosses <laughs> aside and he's like, oh, well, I guess fuck I'm not. this guy. <laughs> it's all politics, you know, when the person who's getting married is always your best friend. Hey, you yeah. know, if they're in a three-piece band together, you can't just, you know, that's probably... You can't a, pick favorites. Yeah, you can't pick favorites. Yeah. All right, so any guys anything else to bring up? Should we move into the mailbag? Oh wow, that's the end of. I mean, our, unless our you guys, karma? unless you guys have anything else you want to bring up. What else happened in this episode? I want to bring up. Um, Alec, Jared, I hear Woody barking. <laughs> let's do it. I think. All right, let's mailbag, start off. Let's, let's start it. off with uh, our voicemail. Okay. So <laughs> we've got another voicemail that is chiming in on the great genital debate. Oh yes. What up, Ice Track? This is Jason from San Bernardino. I wanted to chime in on the great genital debate. Uh, there's no way I'd give up my genitals for mankind. Let's look at my main reason, which would be Alan Turing. He saved hundreds of thousands of people, and when they found out what he was about, they chemically took his genitals away from him. They made him miserable. They made him commit suicide. 
I mean, let's face it, mankind really isn't that great of a species to begin with, so <laughs> I don't think I'm giving up a whole lot for them without a whole lot of perks and maybe a lifetime supply of heroin, I don't know. And the <laughs> people already had that, so yeah. Anyways, rub rub dub dub take it easy, y'all. What I the pre- fuck? I so. appreciate the misery. Uh, for- so I no, I like that, that one. I feel like that was very honest. That we have the yester- last time somebody said, you know what, man, sure, vaginas are weird anyway. And then here's the other guy who's like, no, fuck that. Humanity's not that great. Just you so know, he hedonism I, till I, the end. So so he he did, it seemed like he was a little wishy washy in the but you, you like like his final decision is he he's not gonna cut off his the the Alan Turing right? thing is interesting because you know he's the one who uh, cracked the uh, the Enigma code he he cracked the the German code in World War Two saved tons of British American Allied lives he has the whole artificial intelligence test. Yeah, uh, well, that's a whole. Yeah, so he's a great computer scientist. Broke this code, saved so many lives. Is like so foundational for computer science. And the government, when they found out he was gay, chemically castrated him. Which I actually don't know. Does it just mean like you're impotent? What? Like I don't. I don't know how it works. But it made him miserable, and he killed himself. There's an amazing movie with yeah, yeah. Benedict Cam- Cumberbatch. What's that Benedict called? Benedict Cumberbatch. Does mean? it does it show that part? It, 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 it alludes to it. It alludes oh, okay. to it. Yeah. What was the movie called? It was really good. Uh, uh, the, the Imitation Game. Yeah, the, yeah, game. it was good. Uh, yeah, it's a great movie. Uh, Benedict Cumberbund is great. Uh, but it's interesting, yeah. He saved tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of lives. And the government, in a sort of reverse move, took his junk chemically, metaphorically. I don't, I don't really know what the right one is. But I think that's a great point. Humanity is terrible. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So what, Wait, what, 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 what learning are we taking from this that... He saved hundreds of thousands of people and then got his junk taken off. Against his will. Against his will. And he was miserable for it. And I guess because getting – is what is his message that getting your junk cut off is so horrifying no. that even the comfort of saving hundreds of thousands of people – isn't enough to continue to I, live. I don't. I, I think don't, that I is what he's saying. No, yeah. I don't. But I don't think Alan Turing was like, "Well, without a dick, what's the point of living?" I no. think Alan Turing was like, "I'm gay, and I and like the government has turned their back on me and done this tor- tor- terrible thing to me, and you know I've been ostracized and now I'm miserable." Yeah, you know, th- there's a whole package to it. Well, I think our voicemailers' just whole point was that it there's this is one example of that it sucks to get your penis cut off. Right. Yeah, but there's a lot That's, of things that this was him getting his penis taken off as a punishment. I mean, there are plenty of counterpoints to that. During, uh, like in the 1700s, castrati's where like they would just literally castrate young boys so that they would have a go good singing, puberty. they not go through puberty and have a good singing voice oh, for the royal choir, and <laughs> they lived very comfortable lives and were, at least history says, were. Very happy until their death. I'm sure that that's what their fucking people that made them like that would write in their book. <laughs> Fuck that. That's all, that's all we have to go by, God. Ryan. <laughs> or, or, or there's also eunuchs where if you served uh, in a royal court, uh, they would have their junk cut off so they couldn't, you know, sleep with and impregnate the queen, etc. Well, those people did it. I mean, out of like respect, right? Kind of like as like, I don't, this I don't is my they, job responsibility. Well, I don't really know what was level it? of like eight, like was it? They're like, hey, you, uh, you're gonna serve the queen and you're gonna get your dick cut off, or was it like? I'm going to starve to death, so my only option is to work in the royal car- court. I guess I have to get my dick cut off. Or was it like your boss goes, hey, um, I got a promotion for you. There's perks with it, but <laughs> there's a bad side. You get your dick cut off. And then the guy's like, you know what? My queen is everything. I will do it. I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to assume that back then, people really thought that the queen was divinely just like plucked by God, right. put into a royal your situation. Your, your queen people is everything. fucking lining up to get their dick cut off to, su- to serve the queen. I don't think that's true. I think you're right. I'm just guessing. (laughs) (laughs) Any uh, historians on Unix? uh, Yeah, yeah, hit us up. Leave us a voicemail. Uh, Do I have 213-834-8807? I I forgot to write it down this time. Anyway. We'll put it in the description. Let's go into the email mailbag. So remember, you guys can still email us at squanch at wisecrack.co. Alec, let's get into some questions. If you have more than a 30-second or minute-long voicemail, just put it in an email. Yeah. And we'll read it. And then I'll cut out the fluff. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to edit you no matter what. Yeah, I'm going to edit the <laughs> shit out of you. Uh, so this is an email from Haiti. Uh, sorry if I pronounced Hades. that wrong. Hades. 
Hades. No, H A uh, H A D I. Anyway, this is adjacent to the great general debate, the great uh, killing people with trolleys debate. Beautiful. Uh, Same debate. Yeah. Great job on the podcast. I am currently studying social science in university, and you asked us for ethical dilemmas, and I thought of a really good one, and I've read this one, and it is very good. Hit me with it. Martin Shkreli is tied to a railway. <laughs> oh, <Sorry>. God. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Martin Shkreli is tied to a railway, and you've got a lever at hand that can change the course of a huge train. It's huge. That's important. Uh, if you choose to let the train run over, Martin, you could possibly save thousands of AIDS patients' lives indirectly, but you would directly kill Martin. For the sake of the hypothesis, for the sake of the experiment, we'll say, let's presume that you have no one, no one will know what you did. Okay. What's going to happen to the Wu-Tang Clan album? That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was literally wondering about that the other day. <laughs> well, that's already, that's owned by the United States government now, you know. Oh, it is? Oh, really? Yeah, because he went to prison recently, is and yeah, he, he owes all this money, and yeah. Oh, they, okay. So, so, so it's just sitting in a Congress. filing cabinet it's somewhere? somewhere in the Smithsonian, uh, yeah, in some file cabinet, probably. Wow. <laughs> that's going to be a great, like, history question in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... But My answer is absolutely not. I mean, because it I hope it's matter a, I who hope, it is. I, well, uh, yes, it should kind of. Well, what's interesting about this? Is question, there anybody you would you would? So you're saying that you would not kill Martin Shkreli? Is there anyone on those train tracks that you would kill? Well, no, to okay, save? no. It, I, I'm not saying that that. I, I'm, we're dealing with two di two different dilemmas right now. Basically, there's uh, uh, the the like, would you go back in time and kill Hitler dilemma? You know, yeah. most people would. I don't think Martin Scarelli is Hitler. You know, so True. that's kind of what it, well, that's one it. point. You know, jacking up prices on AIDS patients is shitty, but I mean that's not Hitler shit. You're not yeah, putting yeah, people yeah. in there's, there's there's grades of shitty. Yeah, exactly. So Hitler's then the other the, the other problem is, you know, do do I do I pull a lever to kill to you know, actually kill one person when it would save, you know, lots of people. And we went over this earlier, and we all had... I, I feel like my answer at the end of the day was... No. Wasn't it? Well, what, you can say whatever you want. Now. Well, right. I, God, I, I, I know I said I wouldn't throw the fat guy in front of the train to save, like, a bunch of people. But, yeah, it still is one of those math equations, like, actively kill one. It's it's hard. I mean, I, I, I like this framing because uh, it's a little vague in that I think it's that there's... A rail car that has nobody on it. So traditionally, there's ten people on the rail, and the other one has Martin Shkreli. But in this case, I think what Haiti's saying is that no one's on it, or you're essentially assassinating Martin Shkreli. Oh, that's to right. save yes. these AIDS patients out in the world. But if you think about it, but it would kill the people on the train, right? No, no. It's basically just would you there's kill? An empty would you, train. Would you kill Martin, Martin Shkreli to save a bunch of AIDS? Oh, patients? okay, no. <laughs> yeah, but but also another way to spin the same exact question is maybe the AIDS patients are also on the track, which is theoretically, well, in some ways, the same question. No, now, it is it's different because they're getting killed by a train and not by right. So my my whatever. argument would be I I also hate Martin Shkreli and I think he's human garbage. However, I don't think I would do it either, uh, even though I think he's a monster and uh, whatever. The point is, I would not pull it on him either because there's like so many levels of causation that is him uh killing the aids patients indirectly that like a lot of just like things are really complicated like uh a lot of shit can happen in between we don't even know that like killing him would save these people right uh maybe he'll have the job and then his uh apprentice will come take his job and raise the the price of medication twice as much so i think like my sort of uncertainty in the world would make me not kill him also i just don't want to kill people um <laughs> And as Me much either. as I hate Martin Shkreli, I do find him very fascinating as well. Have you ever seen his live stream? No, but I've the seen him, like, threatening people, like, in videos with, like, mass. He was, like, starting shit with somebody. Do you no, remember? it was, like, rappers and yeah, stuff. Yeah, he was getting in rap rapper. beefs. Yeah, he'd be like, I'm so <laughs> hardcore. And to be honest, he kind of is embezzling all that money. It's pretty hardcore. He's more hardcore than Rick Ross. He's in jail I mean, he, right he, now. He's not hardcore at all. Being in jail if he, is if he got, what are you talking about? When he gets out of jail, he's going to have the perfect rep to create a rap album. That's what all these, I mean, that's what, that's, what, that's, that's what it is to be a rapper. <laughs> you got to get in jail. So then you have like this epic mythos. You think this is a you. plan? No. I hope I'm, 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 I'm mostly joking. I hope when he gets out, though, he says it was his plan. <laughs> yeah, that would help. I'm just saying that it makes your rap a lot harder after you 
after you've been oh, to the Oh, of course. Penitentiary. I mean, shit. Yeah. He, I bet he beat the shit out of somebody on the first day, right? Just so no one He's a pretty short guy. I don't know. <laughs> what do you he, think? I would think he's probably having a rough time. Yeah, I, I that's what I'm saying. I bet it fucking sucks for him and after it, he's not going to want to do anything. What Unless do you think he, his he has so is? much money. I mean, I do know that money still buys comfort in prison. Oh, yeah. I've heard Those that. Those fucking so uh, uh, still... canteens are expensive, yeah. I hear. No, no, I. <laughs> you can bribe people, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get some oh, yeah, you get depending protection. on how many assets he still has, he maybe is living relatively comfortably, just paying people off. I mean, I don't know how long the money's going to last him if he even has any money. He has nothing. The uh, because they he. Yeah, he, but you he, never he, know. He, he might have a rat hole or offshore money that they haven't gotten to. Yeah, or yeah. Who knows? Anyway, let's go on to the next question. All right, uh, this is just an email from B Goins. Uh, hey guys. Oh, so sorry, Brad. <laughs> hey guys, Brad here. Uh, how have you not heard of the song It Feels Good by Tony, Tony, Tony? Pronounced Tony, Tony, Tony. I guess reading that, I shouldn't have read that. Uh, unless you didn't listen to R&B hip hop in the 90s. And the answer is I didn't because I was very young. I didn't. I listened to mostly alternative in the 90s. Mm, you're so cool, Jared. What about you, Ryan? What were you listening to? And I'm, I'm totally ignorant when it comes to music. I've, I've admitted that. I mean, the, yeah, we got a lot of people. We got a lot of shit for not knowing Tony, Tony, Tony. <laughs> I think that that seems reasonable to not yeah. know Tony, Tony, Tony. Give me a break. I don't know. I mean, we all have blind spots somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I was if I was, I was knee deep in Blink One Eighty Two at that point. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> what you weren't? <laughs> no, I, I liked a couple of their songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Well, you said early nine. You said late nineties, or it you just said in 90s. the nineties. In the nineties. All right. Well. All right. What's next? All right. Eric said, emailed us, I've been listening to the audio of every podcast for all three seasons of Rick and Morty multiple times. It actually helped me get through my depression, which I thank you for. Whoa. Oh, you're welcome. Super nice, fucking awesome. <laughs> uh, well, nice. I hate to break it to you that we're on hiatus after this next episode. I hope, I hope you, I... if you need Jesus. some help, let us know. <laughs> Burst this uh, bubble. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I finally Preparing walked... him for reality, Ryan. <laughs> I finally watched uh, my first podcast on YouTube, and I could not believe, and I don't get this reference, I could not believe that Wesley from The Princess Bride was fucking the, was, was the fucking host. All Wesley this time. The, oh, that's was, you. You do kind of, I can see it. I can see it. But Good. he's blonde. Is it? I, right? Is, is he a, it's not Talking gingery? The guy, the guy in all black, right? Yeah. Okay. I can see it. You need, you should wear like a, a Zorro outfit next time and look like that guy. Okay. I mean, Halloween's what, tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Uh, Eric continues, all the time he was a Rick and Morty fan, question mark. Can't wait to listen to you on season four, as you wish, Jared. <laughs> Which is a quote from The Princess Bride. Very cool, Eric. Well, I am I mean, on a serious note, I'm very glad that we were able to help you. And, um, yeah, that really means a lot to us. So thank you for writing in. Last email is from Chris. Hey, guys. Absolutely love the show. I wanted to comment on your discussion of the reasoning for Rick to kill the creature before attempting suicide. This is in the Unity episode. That was the voicemail we got. We got this voicemail? Someone sent in a voicemail, right, about his theory about... Well, the... we got a few. We've, We've got, got a, a bunch of so okay. this is specific one. scene, yeah. I think you guys are overthinking it, which is kind of what you guys are best at. <laughs> True. Right. Uh, I saw it as him testing his suicide machine before using it. The creature was the lab rat to make sure he doesn't botch his suicide. Can't it be as simple as that? Thanks, guys. Chris from Singapore. That's how I read it. I mean, but having said that, you know, we're always going to consider other people's opinions. But, I mean, that's how I read it. Yeah. I think, I think uh, I don't remember the gentleman's name who wrote in his alternate theory. But, yeah, I mean, that's how I read it. That's how I continue to read it. But, hey, the fuck do I know? Yeah. What the fuck do we all know? <laughs> um, I got some live chat. Uh, oh, let's go for some it. Some live stream comments that were pretty good. Um, let's see I here. hope that guy who thinks I look like a pizza guy is in there. What um, was it? Yeah, we asked people to email us and let us know what you think Alec looks like, which, by the way, if you're watching the live stream, he's actually here in Los Angeles right now. And the best one we got was somebody saying that he looks like a pizza delivery guy who's secretly smarter than the people who he's delivering pizza to. While working on his college degree. While working on his college <laughs> degree. All right. So, have you ever delivered a pizza? You ever been a pizza delivery guy? No, but I was in a. I worked in a restaurant through college, so in some sense, I was a person working in a restaurant. Getting smarter a than degree. everyone. I wouldn't say I was smarter <laughs> than everyone. We'll say it for you. It's no. okay. Depends. What was the restaurant? It was a, a Mexican <laughs> restaurant. Okay. I also worked in a French restaurant. Uh, yeah, I worked in a few different restaurants. 
So Logic Boom 007, a couple minutes ago when we were talking about Scarelli, says, <laughs> if it was me, you know, if he was in this problem, if it was me, I'd be like, yo, Scarelli, the price on track changes just went up 10,000%. Oh, so you got good. a few million on you? <laughs> See, there's a, there's that was a, a nice weird. one, dude. Yeah, nice, dude. There's a sort of justice to that. It's very Dante's Inferno. <laughs> Well, Brian but, says, but, Brian DeGame says, you have no idea what you're fucking talking about because Screlly literally invented drugs for rare diseases and saved lives. So joke's on you. I don't know. That's just what he says. That was sarcastic, I think. I don't think it was. But what if Screlly only has the money to bribe you to take him off the train from him raising the prices? Well, no, that's, that's, that's like some Robin Hood shit. I would have to donate the money or keep it for myself. I would donate the money. <laughs> Look okay. at me. I'm so cool and generous. Right, 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 right. All right. Well, um, I, yes, sir, says uh, that Rick Joker t-shirt is so squanchy. Thanks, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. you're squanch AF. Yeah, squanch AF. Uh, Wab Saw says, wow, three grown-ass men start broadcasting about a cartoon. Some people need a job. <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on you. We, this is our job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we... <laughs> All right, and... Um, a couple more. Um, uh, Nevin says, Good day and wubba lubba dub dub from Australia. Pretty Good cool. Day. Good day. Is he in Bendigo? <laughs> Bendigo. <laughs> JT says, Ryan just likes this show because it never poked fun at the South. What the fuck does that mean, JT? <gasps> I like shows that poke fun at the South. <laughs> anyway, I just thought that was a weird comment I'd read. All right, well, we're going to go and wrap it up for today. So, guys, we're going to do one more episode of The Squanch next. I don't know when we're doing it, mailbag. but we're doing a complete mailbag episode. And then we will be signing off until season four. So it's been awesome, and we'll see you guys next time. Wubba lubba dub dub. Where can we find you on the internet, Alec? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You can find me on Twitter at Wisecrack Alec. Where can we find you, Jared? Where can we find on your dog YouTube pictures? channel, Instagram, at Father of Woody. Only dog photos, because that's really the peak of the internet. The internet should have just stopped. It's the peak of life. Really. Yeah. I mean, what, what else is there? Yeah. Um, check out my, uh, 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 I release comedy shorts every week on Ryan's Shorts on YouTube and Facebook, releasing um, a new Weird Al-esque uh, parody. Fast food remix to Ignition. You know, put, <laughs> Weird Al, if you're listening, put me on your next food album, please. I'm, re- I'm looking forward to it. Someone needs to take over your mantle. And with that being said... Goodbye from Hollywood, California, and wobble up and up now! Squanch you later. Bye. All right.